Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 20. Let me read from God's Word. We'll dive right into it. There's a lot to get to this morning about this passage, as you can imagine once we read through it. Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Because where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. During the Reformation, so much biblical truth was recovered that had long ago been lost. The gospel of salvation had been recovered by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, according to the word of God alone. But the Reformation was about more than just the recovery of the gospel. It was also about the recovery of the nature of the true church. The doctrine of the church was recovered there appropriately as well. And, and the Reformers discerned, I think, biblically what were the, the, the marks of a local church, a true biblical church. And they marked down three dynamics of a true church. Number one, God's word is to be preached straight through, expositionally. That's Dynamic number one of a true church. Number two, the ordinances of the Lord's Supper and baptism are to be practiced regularly and rightly. And number three, church discipline must be practiced biblically. Now, which of those three to you is most surprising? And if these three dynamics of a local church stand, then how many true local churches do we have around that are practicing all three? You can see the need for continued reformation in our generation. Now today, this passage is picking up on that third element of a true church, the practice of church discipline, some would say, or others would say church restoration. One is the process, one is the aim or the goal. Both are in play here. But you'll notice this section about the lost sheep just beforehand. And do those two fit together Answer is, yes, for sure they do, and the one informs very much the other, which is why we're blocking them the way that we are. Now, you remember back in chapter 18 that Jesus was asked a question by the disciples, and in his response, he launches into chapter 18. This whole discourse is in response to the disciples' question, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Come on, Jesus, let me have it. I know it's me. You know, that's what they're doing here. And in response to that question, Jesus outlines this fourth discourse in the book of Matthew. So different dynamics of what we're calling true greatness. The disciples ask Jesus, who's the greatest? His response is chapter 18. So in keeping with that, we're marking this whole discourse off as dynamics of church life, because the church is, is the concern of this chapter. Body life, life together. Or you could also say dynamics of true greatness in the kingdom. So the first mark of true greatness, you could say, is to humble yourself before God. Verses one through four, we saw that two weeks ago. Who does it look like? It looks like a little child in dependence upon their father. 
what it looks like is to begin with repentance and faith, the gospel that saves and is embraced savingly, and then the gospel that sanctifies in humility and service ongoing. And this is the, the, the first mark of true greatness in the kingdom. Just to get in, there must be a humility of heart in this way. And then once in and once humbled, then there is a call to love little ones in action, practically, not just in word, but in deed. And, and how? Well, we have to welcome little ones in. Ones, by the way, in verse 6, we find out the little ones are ones that are kind of on the margins of the church. And I was hugely encouraged after the first service, I bumped into someone in the lobby who's very much on the peripheral of the church. Barely got here. And was looking at all of you people, and they said, I don't know what I'm doing here looking at all of you. And so we were hanging on for dear life with this sweet person that showed up just last service. We got to love these people in action, folks. And we talked about this two weeks ago, and I'm doubling down now in light of the fact what just happened after the service. Look around and love little ones in action. Do not just hang out with your family at this church. Do not just hang out with your friends in this church. Look to the margins. Look to the marginalized. That's where I look around and see evidences of greatness in this church all over the place with so many of you that do that. It's the evidence of smallness in this church, a lack of greatness in this church, when people are content to stay in their little cloister. Those are the first two marks of true greatness. The purpose of our text this morning is to show you Mark 3 and 4. The next two. And the next two are to pursue straying sheep and to go to sinning brothers. To go after, to pursue straying sheep and to go to sinning brothers. Let's look at that third dynamic in verses 10 through 14. To seek the straying one with affection. With affection. Now listen, you'll see in verse uh, 10 here, see that you do not, do not despise one of these little ones. That little word or little phrase, the little ones, comes up again, doesn't it? It's been coming up in verses 1 through 9. It comes up again in verses 10 through 14. And so we have to be reminded of who the little ones are here. Jesus in verses 1 through 4 said that the little ones are literally like little people, physical children. And so we need to care for them, and we talked about that. But in verses 6 through 9, Jesus shifts and expands who the little ones are to include those who are on the margins of the church, the marginalized in society who are in our church. And we're called to practically love them. And now we come to little ones who we're called to pursue with affection, those who are straying. Wandering is the sense here. Wandering sheep. They get lost out there in the church. And so this is the third principle of life in the church body, to seek the straying one with affection. Now, to be clear, listen really fast. There is another similar story to this in Luke, the gospel of Luke. And that has to do with an unbeliever you're chasing down. Got it. Done. This is not the same focus here. Same, similar structure, but a different focus. And Jesus does that, by the way. He uses similar illustrations with different points, and that's fair. So just to be clear, who we're talking about here, it's not who Jesus is talking about over in the Gospel of Luke. That will come very clear in just a moment. Now, we want to take a look at what the principle is that Jesus is laying down with this third dynamic of true greatness. The principle, or the what, is to not look down on one of these little ones. Not even one. The word despise in, in your Bible is the word to look down on someone. So it seems like a pretty simple principle. Don't despise them. But then we find out why in verse 10 and 11. And that's actually pretty surprising. Now look at your Bibles for a second, and you'll see why. In verse 10, Jesus says, don't despise one of these little ones because, here's the why, I tell you that in heaven, who? Look at your Bibles. It's not just angels. It's what angels? They're angels. Ooh, okay. 
Here is the proof text for guardian angels in the Bible, by the way. So if you've ever wondered about people who are like, oh, their guardian angel was protecting them there. Or, ooh, man, their angel was doing overtime there. Have you ever heard someone say that? When someone, like, you know, avoids someone throwing up on them or something? Or, or they, they, like, they, like, drive and they barely miss a little bush on the side of the road. Ooh, their angel was protecting them there. That's where they, they get it from here. There's another verse, maybe two in Acts, but this is the main one. Is that what this verse is saying, though? Well, well just so you can know, the grammar of their angels can also mean that, that there are certain angels that are maybe assigned to the class of little ones. There could be a whole group of angels assigned to a whole class of little ones. It could mean that grammatically, a representative kind of approach. It could also mean that there's a, angels that are assigned on a one-off basis. Hebrews talks about this, about angels being messengers of fire. They're on an assignment to care for you today, and an assignment to care for a little one the next day, and an assignment to care for someone else the next day. So it doesn't have to mean, listen, that there's one angel assigned to one little one for all of their life. It doesn't have to be taken, listen, grammatically, in the possessive. It can be taken as a representative class. It can also be taken potentially as a one-off assignment. So don't get hung up on guardian angels, okay? And it's not even the point anyways. The point is that heaven highly values little ones. Don't miss the point. Don't get distracted. Some of you are like, in the Bible, when you do your Bible reading, squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. You know, like, go to the angel. And you totally miss the point of the passage. It's not about that. The point of the passage is the super high value the Lord places on little ones. And the evidence is that those angels that at some point in some way provide care to these little ones have a direct report to God himself. Face to face. God doesn't use a middleman. There's no intermediary angelic service here. It's a direct report. God cares for the, these little ones that are straying so much that the report about the straying ones goes straight to the throne, straight to God's face. And so if these little ones, these straying ones are so highly valued in heaven to God the Father, then they should be highly valued by us in the church as well. That's why we don't despise them. The Father is so hyper-interested in what's happening with the sheep that stray that he demands a direct report. And in that same way, we dare not look down on whom God is so careful to look at. Now, you wonder, well, what does it look like specifically? Hey, I'm glad you asked. That's verses 12 through 14, okay? Uh, the what, the why, the how. The principle, the rationale, the illustration. So th this is really where Christ is taking some time to share that story now about the shepherd's pursuit of the little one that strays. Now, this is the loving pursuit of a good shepherd. Listen, for one of his very own. This is one of 100 that goes out and wanders or strays. And I want you to, to pay attention to the disposition of the shepherd in verses 12 and 13 because you're going to find out that in verse 14, the shepherd is God the Father himself. So the illustration about the shepherd is an illustration about God the Father. And, and so see the heart of the Father because this is going to be hugely important in the next paragraph about discipline. The two go together. The shepherd's pursuit begins with his mind. And if you're going to follow the father's disposition or father's mind, you need to know that as the father's mind knows the sheep, so we too should know the sheep among us. There's a hundred sheep. Who knows that there's a hundred? The shepherd knows. Apparently he counts them because there's one missing and he definitely notices. He notices apparently pretty soon. So he knows them by name. I mean, like echoes of John 10 are going on here. And so to know the sheep is the mark of a good shepherd. But notice that the affections are engaged with the father too. And, and this, in some ways, you may see in the Bible, but you may need to have called out to you. In verse 
12, it says, if a man has 100 sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains? And listen now, go in search of the one that went astray. Do you want to know what go in search means? It means to seek after. It means to earnestly desire. That's why we're using the word at the top, seek the straying one, not just pursue. I had pursue in my exegetical outline. I changed it to seek because it, it, it demonstrates an affection that gets at the term. When a sheep strays, the shepherd seeks with great desire. And if the sheep is found, notice the affection of the heart again. There is great joy at finding the sheep and bringing him home. And so this is the heart of the shepherd. This is the affection. These are the affections of the shepherd. It's not just the shepherd goes and looks for the sheep. No, 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 don't miss this. He desires to seek after the sheep. And when he finds the sheep, he rejoices to find the one who had wandered away from home, but has been brought back. Now, this is a, this is a rebuke to some of us. Because some of you know people in this church that are wandering all over the place. And some of you look at that person and you go, kind of a punk. Person's kind of a punk, pretty self-absorbed. Kind of wandering around over there, just thinking about themselves, getting mixed up in all this straying, wandering around, sin business. I don't have time for people like that. I've got my people here in this church. That's who I spend time with, that's who I invest with. Really? Aren't you glad the Father didn't do that with you? Did you hear me? Aren't you glad that when you were wandering in your sin, that the Father didn't leave you out there on your own, but that he desired you, and he went and found you and brought you to himself? And by the way, that doesn't just apply to salvation. That's in the Gospel of Luke. Here in this passage, there are some of you who have wandered all over the place in your sin in this church. And the Father has gone the same way and has brought you to himself. Should you not do the same way, the same thing? Should you not live the same way? Notice that the will is engaged by the Father too. With your will, there's a desire to protect each one. We're just trying to follow the shepherd's lead here, trying to follow the Father's lead about this dynamic of true greatness to seek the straying one with affection. And you can see now why I say with affection, because your affections are engaged. You desire them and you delight in them when they're brought back. And so your purpose your plan to follow the Father is to not let anybody here walk away from the faith. Now, God has his own plan. The Father has his own perfect purpose. And he can do what he wants. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. But with minds engaged, affections engaged, will engaged, we see the Father's heart about how to shepherd and go after the ones that are straying. What does that look like specifically? I mean, that's, the, that's just an illustration. Well, what it looks like is church discipline. The Father loves the one who disciplines. And he chastises every son whom he loves. So the fourth dynamic is tied to the third, that we're to go to the sinning one for reconciliation. These are not distinct contexts. They are one discourse. The straying sheep is very similar to the sinning brother if it's determined that there has indeed been sin. There are four steps for going. But I want to I have us be reminded of before we go, let's just say that there's a brother and, and, and they, the brother comes and sins against you in some way. You know, like it's been just, there's been an injury, there's been a hurt, there's been an offense and, or, you know, a sin, a transgression committed against you directly. And so you're, you're trying to figure out here, like, wait a minute, does Matthew 18 apply? Oh, really? I got to go into this process? No, you don't actually. 
And that, in fact, next week we're going to talk about how you don't have to go into this process. I'm talking about forgiveness or a lack thereof. But, but here, um, how many of you have never been offended or hurt by anybody? Never. Raise your hand. You've never been sinned against. Yeah, it was the same number of people as in the first service. It's amazing. Okay, so it's 100%. We've all been hurt or injured or sinned against in some way. Did you know that the, the MO, the modus operandi, operandi, whatever you want to say in your Latin, people, is the normal course of operation in life is that we should let love cover it. Now, that sounds so Christianese, doesn't it? <laughs> like, we have a lot of Christianese phrases, and we can throw them out sometimes, you know? Like, we just got to love on these people. Love on people? What is that? Does that sound creepy to you? That's one Christianese phrase we should drop. You know what I mean? But, but like, you know, we also can say, you got to let love cover it. What does that mean? Well, actually, in this case, um, it's straight out of the Bible. So, for example... Um, Proverbs 10 verse 12 says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. So love, the word cover is the word for, for, for forgiveness, and offense is the word for sin or transgression. And so love forgives sin that's committed against you. The opposite is you harbor it with hatred, and that just creates conflict. Another verse, Proverbs 12, 15, the vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignore an insult. So there's plenty of times where you get insulted, right? Um, and someone, you know, you find out someone's been kind of bagging on you. <laughs> maybe it's in the, in the workplace, maybe it's in your own home, you know, maybe it's in your extended family or out in the community or in the church, wherever. And, and so the prudent just, just ignore the insult. You don't have to go tit for tat with people. And then another way that love can cover it is whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. And then 1 Peter 4 kind of brings it all together and says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And so there's always an option for you and for me whenever we're hurt or injured or sinned against, whether it's true or not true, we're, we're always able to let love cover it. Well, what does that mean? That's next Sunday. That's literally, that's next Sunday. We're just highlighting that this is an option today. But so that means that before you even get to step one, you've always got the pre-step of letting love cover it. Now, but there are some times where for some reason you can't let love cover it. Man, you're trying, you're trying, you're trying to cover it. You're trying to like bury it. You're trying to forgive it. You're trying to send it away. These are all you know, different words for forgiveness, but you just can't do it. It just, the video team, Tape keeps coming up in your mind. You, you're waking up at night thinking about the offense. You, it's really unsettling to you. Whenever you see your wife, you're like, oh, you know, like, oh, that thing from last week, you know? Or, or something happened with a coworker and you just can't let it go. Okay, when you get there, if it's a saved coworker, by the way, we're talking about brothers here, which we'll see in a moment, then you can have this process be a good gift to you from Christ himself. But when you go, verse 15, you should go by yourself. So step number one is, is to go by yourself. Now, I want you to, what I did in the first service, I'm going to have you do too. With every head bowed and every eye open, I don't want anybody to look at the screen. I don't want anybody to look up here. I want you to look at your Bibles. Everybody look at your Bibles. Every word counts in verse 15. Observe. This is about a brother. This is not about an enemy. This is not an opponent. Observe number two. This is for sin committed against you. This is not about a disagreement. This is not about a preference. This is not about a, um, an opinion. Number three. This is a command, though. It's a command, not an option. If you can't forgive, you need to go. So it's a command, not an option. Number four. This is to expose, not to explode. Notice, go and tell him his faults. That's in the imperative as well as go, but tell him means to expose, bring to the light. You're trying to bring light to the situation and expose the sin. You're not trying to explode the person and blow them to smithereens, okay? This is very helpful in a marriage context, very helpful. This is also to be done in private, notice, 
between you and him alone. Jesus is emphatic with alone. This is not to be done in public, not to be done online. And this is to win back. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. You've won your brother. This is to win back, not to win against. This is not a competition. And you're trying to beat this person and win. No, no. You're trying to win back someone that is being lost. Connection back to the straying sheep. So every word matters in verse 15 to make sure we don't begin the process on the wrong foot. Now, if you do all those things and you have that conversation, sometimes that's more than one conversation, by the way. Go and tell him his fault can be more than one time. It might be that there's more clarity needed. It might be that you pray and decide to wait and come back again. We, we've seen this happen where step one can be process one. It takes a long time. That's okay. But at some point, if you're not, making, if you're not getting anywhere, then step two is available, which is to go with witnesses. Verse 16. Now, you'll notice Leviticus 19 is a commentary, and really it's, it's the foundation for step one by Christ. You'll notice step two's foundation is Deuteronomy 19 with the two or three witnesses. And so Jesus isn't creating a process out of thin air. He's grounding it in the Old Testament scriptures that he came to fulfill. So go with witnesses. Now, you should know commentators are agreed that witnesses here does not mean witnesses who saw the, the sin happen. It's not what this means here. Because many, many times in step one, the, the, the discussion is about a sin that happened in private. So there's no witnesses like that. Eyewitnesses, you could say. The witnesses instead, you can tell in the verse, are trying to have every charge be established. Every charge be established. So the witnesses are being called to gather data, called to gather evidence. Listen that either validates your brother's sin as sin, like you were right to, to go to him, or that validates that you mistook your brother's assessment that he sinned and you maybe overreacted. Or both. Like you were right to see some sin, but you overblew the sin. And so both can be in play. And this is why the witnesses can take, oftentimes this step takes so much time. It can take weeks. It can take months. <laughs> In one case, it took years. In one case, it took over a decade. In step two, why? Well, let me give you an example. Sometimes someone will say that they know that their spouse is cheating on them. It could take a long time for the witnesses, the counselors, the pastors, you know. It could take a long time to find out who's right. A lot of smoke. Is there fire? Now, if there's not agreement among the witnesses about whether sin was committed, then this step can turn into a process that just takes more time and more prayer for things to come more clear between the two parties. If, however, the sinning brother acknowledges their sin, then forgiveness should be extended from the offended party right away. But even that can be a process. Really? You're going to have... Okay, so, so the offending party acknowledges their affair. And you expect the offended party to just say, I forgive you, and then they're done? No, they're going to need some time to work through that. What does forgiveness mean? They need time. But they need to be willing to engage that way. If, however, the witnesses agree that there was sin, and if the sinning brother doesn't listen and doesn't repent over time, then Christ says to move on to the next step, which is to tell the church. Verse 17, tell the church. Now, the word tell is just the normal word for, for share, say. It, it doesn't mean like declare it from the rooftops and like, you know, post it on social media and pull up an article on the local newspaper. It doesn't say that. It just says, tell the church. On the surface, that's what it means. That's what, exactly what it means. The word church is the word ecclesia, which means gathered congregation or assembled congregation. 
So the gathered church is to be told. Told what? Told what? So when church discipline happens and we, we tell the church, are we supposed to tell the church all of the last six years of counseling and confrontation? Is that what we tell the church? No, no, no. The passage is very clear on this. You tell the church the sin. We've had people before say at discipline, well, we don't know. Any, we need more detail. No, you don't. Well, we don't have any context. You don't need it. Like, <laughs> that's not what the Bible's saying. You just tell the church about the sin. And so, yeah, you better believe that it can be hard and tricky, but we don't need to go into all of the detail. And so, another question you may be asking at this point, telling it to the church is, what sin can move a person into church discipline? You might wonder about that. It's a good question. Like if I kick a rock, you know, in the parking lot and it hits your shin and it, you know, it kind of gashes your pantyhose, is that disciplinable? It depends how expensive the pantyhose are. I don't, I'm just kidding. I don't know what the, I don't know. The answer is no. I like what Jonathan Lehman says, Lehman, about this in church, his book on church discipline. He says this, the Bible provides no exhaustive list of which sins should lead to discipline. But thinking theologically, you may, might say that a church should move toward public discipline only when a sin is simultaneously three things, unrepentant, outward, and significant. And he explains each. The sin must be unrepentant, meaning that the sinner refuses to let go of the sin, stop, or even fight against it. Now listen, that also takes time. You want to know why? Because a sinner oftentimes like responds favorably and then falls back and, and responds again after some time and then falls back and wanders again. Like folks, it's just not gonna be always so definitive. Like it just takes time to, to, to discern, not only are they not letting go of their sin, but they're hardening in their sin. That takes time, usually. Because if they lose the fight, then they start to harden. So it must be unrepentant. It must also be outward, meaning the sin can be seen or heard. We're not making guesses about the states of people's hearts. We have churches that have disciplined people out of the church for motives of the heart that nobody can really understand or see. And the evidence of, the, of are very thin. That's not what this is about. It's outward. It's visible. It's tangible. It's knowable. It's observable and sustained and then it must be significant, significant enough for the church to feel unable to continue affirming someone else's profession of faith. So an embellished story might not count as significant, whereas adultery would. No doubt every situation requires the exercise of careful judgment. We would say here, by the way, that the, the, the New Testament pattern of sins that are disciplined in the New Testament are threefold. Number one, with regard to unrepentant, outward, significant immorality. Number two, sexual morality. Number two, about factiousness or division within the body that's unrepentant, outward, and significant. And then number three, false teaching. False teachers, false teaching, false doctrine, false gospel that, are, that erupts within the church by a church member that's unrepentant, outward, and significant. Those would be, as we can tell in the New Testament, in different passages where there's um, correction that leads to discipline, it's with regard to one of those three areas of sin manifesting one of those three ways. So if the sinning brother has not listened to either the private conversations, step one, or the witnesses' confrontation, step two, then the church is told, step three, so that they can add their voice to the confrontation. You would have a job at this point if we were to bring a name to you. But for what purpose? To drill them? No. Because we all need to start seeking them out for the joy of winning them back. How does that happen? How does reconciliation happen? Through repentance by the offending party. This step, when we bring this before you, usually at communion, to remind us all that, that the blood of Christ has forgiven us of all of our sins, so if this brother who's in sin repents, then the blood of Christ is, is paying for his sin as well. So we want to make sure we say that around the communion table, but... We want to have this step take some time. Usually we give you, the congregation, about a month or two or even maybe three months for those of you in the church who know the sinning brother to go to him and lovingly call him back to repentance. So that's 
the reason why we do what we do here at this church and have done that for years here. And it's occasional, it's not regular, I understand, because it's not often, praise the Lord, that there's such visible sin among the body that's so visibly hardened in the sinner's heart. But if after a while the church's efforts to call the brother back from his sin don't work, then there's the final step, and that final step is to let him be to you as an unbeliever. And, and really, that's, that's exactly what the language says. Let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector, as an unbeliever. It doesn't mean that you never talk to him again. It means that your relationship with him fundamentally changes. You look at him now as an unbeliever, and you talk to him accordingly. You, you share the gospel with him. You call him to repentance and faith in order to be brought into the fellowship of the church. In other words, what we say is you are to relate to him in every way just like you would with an unbeliever. And if you're asking, can I see an example of that in the Bible? Sure, yeah, not right now, but in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, there's, Paul talks about a professing believer, a so-called believer, he's making a profession of faith, who is sleeping with his mother-in-law. And the church is great with it. They're like, yeah, no, yeah, Bob, Bob's fine. I mean, that's, like, what? They're okay with that? So Paul has to write and tell them, you should not be fine with that. And here's what Paul says, remove that person out of your midst. That's the function of step four. But praise the Lord, in 2 Corinthians 2, I think, Paul says in a later letter, hey, 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 you did all that. You did change your mind and you didn't tolerate it. You confronted him and then you disciplined him out. Praise the Lord. And now he's come back. He wants to come back and you guys are, are doubling down on him lay off, loosen up. That word loosen is very much on purpose here. Loosen up and accept him back. The discipline is enough. Restore him now as a brother. So there's a great illustration of church discipline in the correspondence with the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 2. Check it out for yourself. But this is really hard work, you guys. This is really hard work. How many of you love confrontation? Like you love it. Somebody should raise their hand, because I'm thinking about some of you who are like, oh, I love that stuff. Okay, well, nobody's bold enough to raise their hand, but because everybody else would look around going like, I'm staying away from that guy, you know? But there's very few of us that love confrontation. It's true. But, but if we were to go confront, for the purpose of restoration, might you go? Should you go? Well, look, Christ knows how hard it is for you to have this fourth dynamic of true greatness in play in your life. He knows how hard it is. So he provides to you on this dynamic, number four on the screen, he provides you three promises. Three really sweet promises that are yours to cherish and to own and to appropriate and to have it give you strength as you go. And if, by the way, you get confronted and someone comes to you and says, hey, man, I just got to tell you, I just, like, I just thought you, like, you were killing me last week. The, 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 what you said here, what you did here, oh, it's just super tough. And, and I, I think you sinned against me. If someone comes to you, then did you hear the theme in this? Listen, 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 listen. Don't get defensive. Don't fight back. Don't have a, like, well, since you're bringing that to me, I have 75 things I want to bring to you, you know? And out comes the scroll of offense, you know, that you've been harboring up against your spouse. Don't do that stuff. Listen, 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 listen. If someone comes to you. And that's hard too, isn't it? So if someone comes to you, or if you go to someone else, here are th three sweet promises for you, okay? Number one, you should know that heaven affirms you as you go. Now, you being plural, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The you is plural, being the church. So when you get to the latter stages of church discipline and the church is being called in and some people are like, ah, oh, man, are we doing the right thing here? Are we sure that we're doing the right thing? This promise is for you. Whatever you bind in discipline is bound in heaven. Christ is honored in this. Whatever you loose on earth, when, when that sinner repents and, and the straying sheep is brought back home, man, there's rejoicing in heaven and there's rejoicing here. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. The word is set free. It's a good word. It's a good promise to get you to go. Another promise is simply that we would have the Father hearing us. 
the Father hearing us in this. And that's in verse 19. Now, listen, you should know that this verse is very commonly used out of context. How? How? Well, it's like when the, you know, the boyfriend is sitting with the girlfriend and, they, and the boyfriend's trying to lead spiritually, you know, somehow, and he fumbles out this verse. Hey, did you know that if we pray right now, because two of us are here, you know, and then he takes her hand just to try to be, act all super spiritual, and then he says, the Father hears us. Okay, I'm just going to give you a news flash. That's terrible spiritual leadership. You should not be doing that if you're dating a gal, okay? That's just bad news. That's not what this verse means. It doesn't mean that any two people who pray get whatever they ask for. That's just ripping this verse out of context. I heard it, and I, you guys know my disposition toward parachurch ministries. I worked in a parachurch ministry. We have a parachurch ministry we partner with. So I'm not like down, downing all parachurch ministries, but I had a parachurch leader tell me one time, hey, 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 I know you're a church guy, but, but it's okay. Wherever two or three gather, <laughs> there's Jesus in their midst. I'm like, bro, don't, don't use that verse. That verse is out of context. This is about the church in the process of discipline, struggling with the process because it's hard and Jesus giving us sweet promises to keep us going. Wherever one person goes to another and, and, and talks to them, verse 15, you can be assured that if they pray together, the Father hears their prayer. In step two, wherever two or three go and they pray and ask for wisdom and clarity, you can be assured that the Father is going to answer that prayer. If the church goes and all of us are being asked to pray, and we do this every time we bring someone to, to discipline, we ask all of you to be praying. You have this promise as truth that the Father's gonna hear us and answer in accordance to his will. He'll give us what we want as we ask him for his glory to be made known. And then this third promise is that in this process, the Savior is with us. This is so great for when you have to go. Or like if, if someone approaches you and you're like, hey, I need to talk to you about something you did to me the other day. And you're like, whoa, wait, what? What did, I, what did I do? Holy smokes. Or if your spouse comes up to you, you know, or if somebody comes up to you in the church. I mean, this is like, this is, this is really helpful to remember this promise. Um, insofar as there is the other dynamics in play, humility. Insofar that there is practical love in play, insofar as there is seeking after the one who is straying, then, then there can be an assurance that, that Christ is with you in this. Praise the Lord, you've got it going alone. And praise the Lord that if you ever get talked to, you're not being talked to alone either. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Where are they gathering? In the context of this passage. Do not rip this out of context. We do so to make the verse something that we consume rather than something that we use in context. So listen, the pursuit of greatness lies in these four body life dynamics. If you want to pursue true greatness, which is what the disciples wanted, and by the way, uh, part of me is like, it's not bad to ask the question. But if you're going to ask the question, if, you, if that's what you want, then you should know that in the context of the church, you need to work on continuing to humble yourself, to love the little ones, the ones out in the margins of the church. You need to seek the straying one, the, one, the wandering ones in the church. And then you need to go to the sinning one who sins against you specifically. And that as you do this, you're one of the little ones that's also a great one in the kingdom. You don't get to be a great one without becoming little first. And by the way, Christ isn't done with us yet. There's still more to go, isn't there? The last dynamic next Sunday is probably the hardest one of all. But the sweetest one of all when it's put into play. So let's just ask for God's help here today and thank him for the blessing that Christ is with us. The Father hears us and strengthens us. Lord, we thank you so much for 
your word and for the ways that we are able to, have been able to practice this in the past in every occurrence, it's been heart-wrenching. It's been slow. It's been methodical and all of us involved, I know, in different places at different times have been driven to the end of ourselves, absolutely dependent upon your wisdom and the clarity that only you can bring. And yet, Lord, you have been faithful to us, your people, and we want to acknowledge your good work among us as this passage has played itself out in the past. But we also pray, Lord, that you would help us in the future to never forget the heart that you have, God. The, the, the shepherd's heart to seek after the one that's straying and delighting and being overjoyed at when they're restored. God, I pray that you would help us to have that disposition as you call us to potentially put this text into play. And in that way, Lord, we just desire to mirror you, our great shepherd, and your son, who is also our great shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us the grace to walk with you this week and to trust in your word if you call us to this this week too. We ask all of this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.